Hello, 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 and welcome to Pixel Chatter number 26. Hope you're all doing well. Just see if I can get things working here. Got some really weird stuff going on technology-wise. So you're going to see, look at me, I'm very pixelated, <laughs> which is not good. Uh, picture happening here from this camera. Uh, there we go, let's try this one. All right, that, there we go, should do the trick. So I don't know what's been going on with the software, but I think I need to contact somebody from uh, Wirecast and have a chat to them about the fact my live streaming software keeps crashing, even though I've upgraded everything. Uh, but uh, it's a crazy stuff, hope you're all doing well. Let's have a look in the chatting box here, the chatting box. Good morning, Chance. Good morning, Susan. Jeff, g'day. Handy parts, how are you going? John from New York. What's the temp in New York at the moment, John? I bet you it's pretty cool. Of course, having a coffee out of the Pixel Chatter Live mug. All right, so just uh, if, the, if, the, <laughs> if the stream for some reason just completely drops out, uh, please, I'll get it up and running as quick as I can. Just hang around. I'll do what I can. Uh, what else we got here to do? Tim, g'day. Tim from South Florida. Greg, which is Photography Australia. G'day. Photographia. G'day, Ren. John. It's all working. That's good. From Liverpool. G'day, John from Liverpool. Sam, Brian, Anthony, Joris from Belgium. George. From uh, Teesdale near Geelong, so another Aussie. G'day, George. Kathleen from Humid Brizzy. It's humid in Sydney as well today. I think it's just the after that lot of rain we had. Uh, John said it was minus 15 last weekend, but now it's like plus 15. I think, um, there you go. That's a bit warmer. Sounds and images from the UK. G'day. Hope the Aussies aren't too warm and the Americans too cold. <laughs> Don't know how you're going from the UK there. Cool bananas. All right, let's get stuck into episode number 26. Once again, thank you so much for joining the live stream. Uh, I've got plenty of stuff coming up for 2018, uh, but the live streams will continue to happen. I know that it's not everybody's cup of tea, but those of you that love hanging around with me for an hour, we have a bit of fun. We critique a few images and uh, and we just talk photography, which is what it's all about. Now, if you do want to get one of your images critiqued on the Pixel Chatter show, all you've got to do is you've got to email me at ben at on three legs, and that's the word three. So ben at on three legs, as in a tripod, dot com. Um, Links are down in the description with the email link there. Uh, send me through three images. Try and make them about 3,000 pixels on the widest edge uh, and include all the EXIF information. A bit of a backstory as well. Not 10 paragraphs. I don't have time to read novels on your photos. <laughs> But if you can give me like a sentence or two to explain how you took the shot, where you were, uh, what inspired you, whatever you like, you can add whatever you like, and I will make sure it shows up on one of these shows. All right, now let's get stuck into today's show. Plenty to cover. Um, the first thing that I want to cover though is I think um, that I have in the past spoken to you all about uh tasmania and i know um i've got quite a few of you now booked in to come and have a bit of a hangout with me in tassie in may this year and we're doing two groups because the first group sold out in five days the second group still has a couple of spots left uh, and what that means is that you can still come along if you want to come along may is a little bit away and we'd love to see you there uh, in tassie now if you're wondering um you know what sort of shots you might get in tassie I'm going to show you some of the shots that I got uh, in Tassie when I was there uh, doing this Cradle Mountain tour uh, last time. So what happens is, the good thing about Tasmania is during the day, if it's overcast, or even if it's not overcast, you can get into the rainforest and still do a lot of photography. So there's some, some pretty cool things you can do. Um, this is sunrise at Dove Lake. With a very famous uh, boat shed, you've probably seen this before, uh, and the you can't see Cradle Mountain, it's, it's shroud and cloud, but that's okay. Some mornings are better than others. <laughs> Here you can see, um, same place, different uh, perspective or different composition, and uh, you know this time we can actually see most of the cradle, and you can see the sun just kissing the top of that mountain. 
uh, which I just love the way that that happens. Um, here's another one from within the rainforest uh, in uh, in the middle of the day. Well, I've just laid down on the floor. Uh, I just love the pattern these trees were making above me. And they grab that shot. Um, once again in the rainforest. Now the rainforest has all these beautiful pathways through them, uh, which means it's easy to sort of uh, trek around and look for fungi and, uh, and amazing compositions. And there's so many things to shoot in Tasmania. Things like this, this is one of the little uh, creeks that we crossed when we we're walking through. This is right near Cradle Mountain, by the way, in the National Park there. Uh, and you can see that, uh, you know, just interesting shots to be taken. Um, also, not too far away here, you'll also find a lot of wildlife, wombats, kangaroos, and other things to take shots of. Uh, and uh, just a beautiful little spot. Uh, once again, back to Cradle Mountain. You can see here the, the cradle is a little bit more apparent. Um, this is from another a glacier rock. Um, I shot this. So if you, as you go on the walk, there's a walk you can do right around Dove Lake. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to get to this particular spot. You get up onto this rock. And uh, it's a great uh, perspective of the Cradle Mountain. And then, you know, getting a bit creative. This is actually a uh, uh, after sunset shot, a very long exposure, just being creative. And as I mentioned, lots of fungi. Um, if you're into shooting macro, uh, I'm going to be taking my macro gear with me and looking for macro. And uh, anybody who wants to come hang out with us whilst we do that, Michael's right into it as well. We will be shooting a fair bit of macro, which is a bit of fun. So that sort of gives you a bit of a, an insight into some of the things that you might see. Um, oh. Just trying to sort out Lightroom here. Some of the things that you might see uh, when you're out there in Tassie. And it's not just about Cradle Mountain. It's about doing all these other things. And if you're like me, sometimes getting out in the outdoors and just sort of cruising around the rainforest is just uh, its just a great escape, you know. And so one of the things I love doing is looking for fungi. And then uh, most people don't know this, but most fungi shots, you don't just shoot the fungi as you find it. You've got to, you get a pair of tweezers and you clean them up a little bit. You might try and find some moss on a, on a, uh, a log that you can put behind it to give it that contrast rather than having dirt behind it. All these things that you can do to really spark up that shot. You use a reflector to get the light back up underneath the fungi. Uh, of course, you're going to need a high... Uh, uh, a higher aperture, so a longer exposure, so you need a tripod, you know, there's a lot of a lot of work. It could take an hour, two hours to shoot one fungi. So, um, you know, if that stuff interests you, then to come along to the trip, I'm going to put a note into the chat box right now. To come along to this trip, uh, all you have to do is click on that link and have a chat to Michael, who I'm doing this trip with. I think he's actually just gone away to somewhere in Africa to shoot animals, but um, shoot him an email anyway. Or you can talk to me. I'll help you through the process. All you got to do is pay a $500 Australian dollar deposit and you're on your way. All right. Uh, but we do only have two spots left. So if you want to come along, I'd love to see you there. Uh, now, the next thing I wanted to mention for uh, everybody, especially if you're a VIP. Now, if you don't know what a VIP is, it stands for Very Important Photographer, which I know you all are, but uh, we have an On Three Legs VIP. And to become an On Three Legs VIP, you need to become a Patreon, where you go to patreon.com slash on three legs, and you join the VIP group. Now, we've got a hangout coming up. So for those of you that are already VIPs, uh, we've got a hangout coming up on the 24th of January at 8.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you're not a VIP, the way these work is unlike this, where I do all the talking, you do all the listening. In a hangout, we actually all talk together, and you can ask questions, and we chat about techniques and uh, you know, I might share screens and give tips and advice or other other photographers that are in the hangout also can contribute to that advice. So it's a, it's a really, it's, a, it's just a community uh, hangout and it's VIPs only. So it's a much smaller group and uh, yeah, it's awesome. So if you want to get involved in that, let me know. Uh, once again, all the links will be down below this video. All right, I'll just quickly check the chat box before we get into the viewers kit. Uh, chat box, what's going on? What's going on? 75 in Arizona. I'm, I'm, that's Fahrenheit, of course. So w when we convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, we take away 32 divided by 2. It's very rough. Uh, but 35 less the 32 which makes it, what, 43? Uh, divide that by 2, so it's 21. That's actually pretty warm. That's actually pretty good, if that's what it is. Um, now, what have we got here? Bala, g'day. Brian, George Judkins in Belmont. Oh, we've got two people in Belmont. Excellent. You guys should go and hang out and find some jetties to shoot. <laughs> uh, Tassie's trip sounds ace. Yes, it will be ace. It will be absolute ace. Alrighty. Awesome. Fantastic. Let's get stuck straight into viewer kit. So, 
Today we have a viewer kit from Stephen Algy, aka Spanner. I haven't seen Spanner here today, uh, but this is Stephen Algy's kit. Now, if you don't know what the viewer kit segment is all about, uh, this is about shooting in your viewer kit. Uh, for everybody to see and uh, the reason I did that uh, or started the segment was I actually was featured on a site called shotkit.com which you can go and check out it's awesome uh, and Mark from Shotkit has uh, started this site where he features all these photographers kits and allows you to sort of see what's in their bag and get an understanding for what it is other people shoot with uh, and so here we have uh, Stephen Algie's kit so he just said I just finished my landscape kit got my oh, just finished I don't know <laughs> he said finally finished my landscape kit oh yeah uh, I don't know if mine's ever finished but anyway he said I got my EF uh, 55 to 200 this week and I thought it was time to share my kit my camera is a mirrorless Canon M5 fitted with an L bracket uh, he has the lenses are a EFM 22 mil, 11 to 22, a 55 to 200, and a 15 to 45. And he uses the Nissi filter system, which is what you can see there in those beautiful cases. I wish Lee would do that. Uh, Nissi uh, provides beautiful. Um, yeah, Anthony said it looks like a Nissi man. Yeah, <laughs> but Nissi give you beautiful cases for their filters. Um, with uh, Lee, you've got to buy them additionally. Um, uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure these cases are included in the starter kits with Nissi. Uh, which is pretty cool. So he said he's got a 3, 6, and 10-stop neutral density filters. He then uses a 6-stop soft grad, 6-stop reverse grad. Now, if you don't know what a reverse grad is, go and Google it, but essentially the graduation starts from the horizon and works its way back up to the top, and that's really important pre or post sunrise or sunset uh, because the light is at its most intense on the horizon, so that's pretty cool. Um, uses a Zomi carbon fiber tripod which uh, I don't, never even heard of Zomi, so there you go and a Vanguard backpack he said it's a really good lightweight kit for landscape photography uh, and, he'll, and he's a motorcycle rider like myself so a man after my own heart and he'll go out f doing his photography on his Triumph 1200 Explorer and he said everything just fits nicely in the top box so you know that's really important when you're thinking about how you're um, you know how you're going to be traveling with your kit to make sure that you can fit it. That's the thing I love about the Fuji mirrorless kit. These mirrorless kits, all of them, are just that little bit smaller because uh, that's the way they work. Um, so there you go. So that's uh, that's Stephen Algie's kit. His viewer kit, which is kind of cool, isn't it? So thanks, Stephen, for sending that in. Now, if you want to send in your viewer kit so we can showcase it on Pixel Chatter, same thing. Links down in the description below. Shoot an email to me, Ben, at on three legs. That's the word three. Dot com, or you can just message me through Facebook Messenger on the Facebook page, and I will get it that way, uh, which is how a lot of people seem to do it. Um, don't do your um, your critiques that way, though, because we won't get a very good file. Um, but happy for you to do your viewer kit through the Facebook messaging system. All right. What's going on? Let's have a look at the chat. Lots of people here today. Dennis, g'day, Dennis. John said he just sold all his Lee filters. Yeah, my Lee kit didn't come... Oh, yeah, my Lee kit did come with a nylon case, but it's nowhere near as nice. For me to get a better case uh, that was uh, more protective and I could put multiple filters in, uh, I had to buy it. And I think some of you might have seen that in some of my vlog videos, but I, I had to purchase it separately. The ones Lee gives you are just individual cases for each filter. The problem with that, it just takes up a huge amount of room. So I bought the Lee case for the 7.5 set and for the uh, 150mm set. Uh, I bought the two cases... And they work great. They're awesome. But, you know, I just love the way Lee includes it. I think it's good. A quick Pixel Chatter coffee. Who else is having a cup of coffee as we do Pixel Chatter? Or who's drinking a beer or having a scotch? Or Because <laughs> I know we've got all different parts of the world here represented. Mm. And I'm enjoying my cup of coffee this morning. All right. Even though it's a bit humid here this morning, I probably could have done with a water. All righty. Let's get stuck straight into Lightroom tip. Now, I've got a pretty cool Lightroom tip for you. In fact, I'll jump back into that Tassie collection um, so you can see how this works. Let's just do that now. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that. Here we go. And I'm going to give you this shot. All right. So uh, each week I try and cover a Lightroom tip. Well, I've been doing pretty well at that. I think there was only one week I missed out because I had technical trouble and didn't get time to do it. Um, this week's Lightroom tip, I'm going to give you some shortcuts. I'm a big fan of shortcuts.
Okay, I should be back now. Hopefully you've got me back. Talk about crazy stuff, eh? Crazy stuff. What did my computer crash into? <laughs> it crashed into the ocean of, I don't know, pixels somewhere. Hopefully you've got me back. Let me know if you've got me back and you can hear me. Let me see. All right. And uh, just checking everything works, check the stream. And uh, every time I launch Lightroom with something a little bit more intense, it crashes. So I think, um, I mean, I've upgraded everything I can. I think I'm going to have to work back on <laughs> getting that up and running, but I'm happy that you've all got me back. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. And uh, I think... I think YouTube's used to it because they're uh, they're very good at not interrupting the stream. Like when I restart the stream, it just jumps back into the same live stream. Okay, yes, I'm back, George. Yeah, he says Susan. Bingo says Sam Lyle. G'day, Ben. I watched your video on bracketing from a couple of years back. Nice teaching style, dude. I like this little chat show too. Thanks, Lyle. I uh, Tim says always Adobe's fault. We'll go with that, eh? Um, the other thing that I have changed is I've added this uh, extra camera. Um, over Christmas, but that shouldn't affect things. It's just a USB camera, so. Uh, but it, uh, yeah, I don't know what's causing the uh, the load on it. But uh, always interested to um, be always interested to see if there's something we can do to make it work better. But uh, I don't know what else we can do. All right. So where was I? I think I was giving you a Lightroom tip. That's right. And I was talking about Lightroom shortcuts. Uh, so let's just jump straight into that. Let's see if we can get that working because. Uh, I love shortcuts, and so I'm going to jump into my Lightroom catalog. Let's see. All right. So far, so good. I'll get rid of the on three legs on there. Let's get rid of that. You don't need that. So you can see what's going on. Give me this blank shot. There we go. All right. So this is a catalog of some of my images that I've taken, um, and I have a folder. I don't know if you can see the folder name that says to be blogged. Um, so when I take a photo, typically I stick it in this to be blog photo. So there's a lot of photos in here. Um, now, one of the things when you when you've got a lot of photos, sometimes it's easier to use shortcuts than mucking around touching things. And so because I use I use a trackpad, I use a Wacom tablet and my keyboard. I'm a big fan of shortcuts. Um, so what I do, so once you're inside of one of these. Um, one of these libraries if you use the plus or minus key on your keyboard you can change the size of the thumbnail so that's just me hitting the minus key as you can see you can get in a now I know there's a thumbnail slider just here uh, on the right hand side but using the keys just makes it easier because now I can just sort of quickly do things now if I want to open one image let's say I click on that image and I want to open it uh, if I hit D it'll just go into develop which is kind of cool uh, if I highlight an image and then hit the space bar I go to a full image okay and then if I hit G again it'll take me back to the library so as I'm going through if I want to have a look at a photo I go oh, I like the look of that let me see is that any good I just hit the space bar and it opens up. And of course, I've showed you this one before where you hit the L key and you can sort of just isolate the image and have a quick look at it. Uh, hit the G again, it goes back to the library. So it allows you to sort of go through the library, quickly identify your shot, make it big, have a good look at it, go, mm, what do I want to do with that? No, hit G again, takes you back to the library. And so you know, I'm a big fan of shortcuts. I know I've showed you a few shortcuts. I think some of you really enjoyed seeing the shortcuts, but it does, makes life really easy. You know, hit the space bar, there's my image. Hit my L key twice. I get a really nice preview. Yep, is that the image I want to share? Uh, no, G takes me back into my catalog. And you can see that even with the L, like the catalog, the library, you can hit the L key and have them all isolated. So you're not seeing your other stuff. You're just seeing what you want to see. Uh, and it makes, makes life really easy for just picking photos that you want to share on social media or you want to work on or it doesn't matter what it is. You know, you just, it's a, such a good, it's a, it's a good shortcut. Um, and it's one that I use a lot because it just makes life easy. Um, just going through some of my photos here. This 
from the past. Oh, this is my favorite from Tassie. If you haven't seen this one, this I'm I'm gonna um on my phone I have an app for tracking auroras. So if you come to Tassie with me, there's a chance we might be up all night. <laughs> Because if there's an aurora and the sky is clear, I'll be out there. And anybody who wants to join me will be welcome to because uh, it's a lot of fun shooting auroras. Anyway, that sort of gives you a bit of an idea of some of the things that you can do in Lightroom, just making your life a bit easier. And uh, yeah, I really like the way Lightroom works with shortcuts. I think it's a good way to, to get around quickly. And uh, yeah, hopefully that you are taking those tips and you're enjoying those tips. All right. Now, let's get stuck into some critiques. Huh? I think, well, let's do that now. I'm ready for some critiques. I'll just check the uh, check box quickly and see. Uh, is our great MBN causing some problems? Yeah, probably. I know that does create problems with the feed every now and then. We were on uh, ADSL before. The MBN is actually a lot better for us. It's not fast, but it's much better than what we had. Uh, have I considered changing streaming software? No, I use Ycast and uh, it's expensive. Go and have a look at how much it costs to get. Uh, it's supposed to be the bees and knees of live streaming software. Uh, it's just something I've just got to work out. Um, and with your patience throughout this year, we'll work it out. It's just one of those things. Um, you know, I know it. Maybe I just can't share large files on Lightroom. I think as soon because as, it's only when I um, I use Lightroom with raw files does it crash. So it's obviously something in the processing power of the computer. And I upgraded from eight. Uh, megabytes of memory to 32 megabytes of ram and that uh, still has a problem so <laughs> we'll see what happens ah uh, there you go yeah obs is a free open source one says daniel but it's very uh, uh it's much more difficult to use this is easy to use yes as chance said i've got 32 gigs that so should be enough it should be enough but uh but there could be yeah maybe there's a problem with the memory who knows all right well let's get stuck into some uh, critiquing. I've, I've got my coffee here, my pixel chatter coffee. Let me just finish that off. We'll have a bit more of that and we'll get stuck into a critique. So this week, all right, let me jump into Lightroom. We've we'll got image critiques. This week I've got three images. Um, and I'm going to hopefully get through all three. Last week I didn't get through all three because of the uh, the technical issues this time. I was ready for the technical issue this time and I actually prepared myself to make sure that when it happened, I was going to get it up and running again very quickly. Uh, so if it does bog out on me again, you'll know what it is. But I don't think it will because I'm not sharing any more large raw files. We're just doing JPEG, so it should be okay. Um, now I can hear, see people talking about RAM fails. Maybe that's my issue is I've got faulty RAM. Is there a way to test it? Please, if someone knows, tell me and I will test it. I'd be more than happy to see if it's, the, if it's, if that's a problem, I'll just go back. So that was $600. I'll go and get that sorted. Okay. Uh, so image critique, where will we start? Let's jump across here. And I've got three images. I'm going to go full screen and show you these. Let's do this. Let's... So this one here is by Daniel Korslund in Norway. Um, and I was going to do this one last week, I think, and we ran out of time because of the fault that I had. Uh, but beautiful Milky Way shot. We'll come to that in a second. Um, and we'll look at the technical aspects. We'll look at the composition and what could have been done better. Um, the next image we've got is this one here. And this one here is by... Stephen Cast. Thank you, Stephen, for sending that in. Oh, wow. I think it's going weird here on my thing. There we go. Um, so this one here is by Stephen Cast. So thanks, Steve, for sending that in. Great to uh, have you sending in. What he said, I finally found a peer. I'm calling it a jetty. Uh, but he said, I fa fa finally <laughs> found a peer, uh, which is cool. And then the next image we've got is this one here. And this one here was sent in by... Uh, Rob Roy, there we go, there's Rob's Rob's photo, check that out, this one was sent in by Rob Roy, and we'll get stuck into that shortly as well, and have a look at uh, his image, and uh, what uh, I think could have been done better, and we'll critique it, and we'll go from there. So, let's jump straight back into, uh, let me go back over here now to the library, we'll use this shortcut that I've shown you, we'll get rid of those black lines. And we're going to go straight into this one here. Okay, now this is uh, Daniel Korslund's image. Uh, and as I said before, it is a Milky Way shot. 
um, which is always fun to shoot. And this one, I love it's, it. The reflections on the water are just as strong as the sky, which is kind of cool. Um, so let's have a look at the details, the technical aspect of the shot, and then we'll get stuck into the composition because uh, there's a couple of things you could do to really improve this shot. First of all, um, to give you the details, shot at ISO 2000. Now, I know um, I always say shoot as low as you can go, and in this example, um, you know, you're going to have to, when you're shooting uh, uh, the Milky Way or astrophotography, you've got to bump your ISO up a little bit. Now, the good thing is if the sky is full of stars like this, uh, it's it's not as easy to see the grey. Now, I would um, uh, make sure, though, that you're really careful about what setting you go to because maybe you could have done ISO 1000 and gone for 15 seconds instead of 30 seconds. So Daniel here has gone for 30 seconds at f2.8. Same thing uh, in a, in a uh, astro shot, you kind of have to shoot wide open. It's very difficult to get uh, any of this astro detail if you're at um, you know f11 or 16 or something like that. So... Uh, the time you'd need the shutter open, would you'd all end up with all sorts of burnt pix, pix, hot pixels. So, you know, and I haven't done a huge amount of astro, but I've done enough to learn the lessons that you've got to open, shoot wide open. You're going to have to push your ISO up a little bit. Uh, it's just the way it is. Now, if I go back to my um, the shot that I had taken, where is it? Of that of the. Um, there it is. Let's go to that one there. That one. Give me an example. There we go. This one here is of the Aurora. Um, you'll see that I had taken this at ISO 1600. Uh, but also, same thing, 30 seconds f2.8. So you've just got to, uh, when it comes to shooting the sky, you're going to have to put up with the fact that you're going to have to push your ISO up a little bit and uh, you're just going to have to work with that because unfortunately, um, you're not going to capture the light otherwise. Very difficult to capture the light. So from a technical aspect, I think he's done well. Um, but I would always try a few different settings to see if I can get if I can capture the light at uh, a lower ISO because you always want to go as low as you can go. And maybe in this example, that's as low as you could go. Who knows? All right. Now, he shot this with a Nikon D610. Um, so this is a, a, a 610, and uh, the lens he was using was the uh, 14mm f2.8 prime lens. So 30 seconds at f2.8. Now, someone's asking if it's a composite. I don't think it is. I think it's one image um, because, uh, yeah, I think it's one image for that purpose. He's saying it, it, you'd expect the lights to be blown out. They are They are pretty blown out. Those lights might be really uh, dull lights. They might not be very bright lights. Um, and you'd be amazed at how light the, um, you know, the Milky Way can be uh, when you start looking at the... Uh, the Milky Way. But let's jump into the develop module and I'll just, um, I've turned the red highlight notification on and you can see straight away that these highlights are blown out. You'll also see that most of his stars are blown out. So um, he probably could have shot this at a lower ISO. It's also very, very noisy. So you can even see the grain that's in that. It's extremely, extremely noisy. So one of the things that you need to do uh, when you're you know, shooting with a um, with a, a, a high ISO is you've got to learn how to then get rid of the noise afterwards. Um, you've got to take that. You've got to take that time to learn how to do that. And there's all sorts of different software to do that. Lightroom is actually not the best tool to remove noise. You can do it in here, and I'll show you how. But it's not the best tool. Um, now, so besides the blown highlights. And I actually think this is slightly overexposed for what you're after. I mean, it's a nighttime shot, right? So it should be dark. So don't be afraid to, you know, do something like that. Um, you know, let's just have a look at the difference that made. That was before, that's after, right? Just by dropping the exposure, it's totally, absolutely, totally changed the dynamics of that image. So the first thing when I saw this, I thought, geez, that's a bit bright. Don't try and make the nighttime daytime because um, it doesn't look right does it and the reality is that i was probably sitting there and this is probably closer to what my eyes saw um so straight away when i saw it, the geez that's overexposed now i've dropped that 1.2 um let's go one and a half i'm gonna go one and a half dropped at one and a half stops now one of the good things about doing that is you, the noise becomes harder to see the other thing now if you look at my highlights nothing's blown out okay so what i've now got is 
a shot that looks like night time um, and I can start to really work on that. So things like contrast, um, you know, bring my maybe bring my highlights back a tad. Shadows, I want to be careful because I don't want it to look like daytime. So I'll probably just keep my shadows at zero. Um, let's let's put the whites and the blacks where they need to be. And you know, clarity. Let's give it a bit of clarity. Clarity works beautiful on uh, stars in the sky, as does a bit of vibrance. Get that colour. Obviously, it's uh, pre-sunrise or pre or after sunset. Let's. What time was this taken? Let's have a look again. It was taken at. Um, there you go, 10.30 p.m., so it was after sunset. Um, so that sort of, you know, straight away to me gives you that look that's just that little more natural. Um, and I've got rid of the really harsh brightness, made it look a little bit more like what you'd see if you're out there. So that's before, that's after. Now, the other thing that um, I noticed straight away, so that's the basic adjustments which we've done. Um, the other thing I noticed straight away is there was a fair bit of distortion here. Now, this is going to happen with a, a 14 millimeter lens, right? Just going to happen. And, of course, he's on a tripod and he's pointing his camera lens up, of course, because he's taking a photo of the sky. So you can see straight away that things like... Oh, don't do this to me, Lightroom. There we go. Things like this here, you can see they're leaning in. All these trees are leaning into the shot. Uh, and that's a result of shooting the lens up. So we know we've got some distortion. The other thing is I feel like this in the middle is bulging towards me. So I've got a couple of choices. Now I know this is a Nikon 14mm uh, 2.8 lens. So let's just jump into lens profile. Enable profile correction. Let's go to Nikon. So you choose Nikon. And I don't have the 14mm 2.8 in here. I haven't downloaded it. But I've got the 14 to 24 which is very similar, okay? So I don't know if you saw how quick much change that made. So that was before and that's after. Can you see that? So it's making quite a difference. So just by using a profile, now if I downloaded the actual profile, it would probably do a better job, but I still can make more correction here. So I can actually use this slider to make more correction. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it a bit more um, just to fix that up. And you'll see that straight away. Now the other option, of course, is I can go to manual and do it manually. Um, and I have got these transform um, sort of selections as well. So if I get rid of lens corrections, below lens corrections is transform. So I can then, there we go, I can see Daniel's highlighted me in the box. That's cool. It's a Samyang 14mm. Okay, well, it would be similar. I mean, similar to the Nikon one. Um, so I can actually then go in here and I can transform this image to try and get rid of more of the distortion, but I'm going to always lose parts of my image. So you see as I do any sort of transforming, I'll lose parts of my image. Now because the lens was uh, pointed up, if I want to try and make it look more natural, I need to bring it down like that. Um, now, which will mean I'm going to have to crop my image if, um, if I'm going to leave it like that. And I may lose something important, but I don't think I would in this image, so I'm actually going to give it a go. I'm going to bring my crop lines in. I'm going to bring my crop lines in. There we go. Look at that. And in fact, it puts the Milky Way a little bit closer to a line on my rule of thirds. So I'm just going to crop it in. I'm going to crop it in using the distortion. There we go. Look at that. All right. So now um, I've got something a little bit different, uh, less distortion, still got a bit of distortion as you can see over there, it's going to be really hard to remove all of it because of the angle it was shot at, but uh, you're going to get a bit of distortion because of, what's, uh, because of what's going on. Now the other thing to watch when you're shooting with uh, 40mm, which Daniel's done beautifully, is your focus, because, um, sorry, when you're shooting at 2.8 is your focus, because at 2.8 your depth of field is going to be rotten, you're not going to have much at all. Uh, but in an image like this where there's no foreground, and then you're not going to have foreground in an astro shot, right? So, well, rarely. Um, if you do, you're going to have to stack it. But as you can see here, no foreground, which means you need to focus on whatever's here. Um, you know, and focus on that. Make sure that's in focus. Don't worry about them. I mean, this tree here's not going to be a big problem if it's slightly out of focus. Uh, but you really want that definition in the uh, horizon. So good job there. Uh, the other thing, I think the colour's slightly out, so the white balance, and this is one of the things cameras struggle with at night, is that um, you know the white balance will struggle a bit. So I just, you know, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna cool it down just a tad because I want it to look more like night. 
Um, there we go. I like that. Just increase that contrast a bit. I'm just going to bring the blacks down a little bit more. Something like that. There we go. Um, once again, here's before, here's after. So you're sort of getting a feel for... Now look at the distortion. As a, the distortion to me was a major factor. And you can see the difference it makes when you um, pull that distortion out. Some of these, I mean, these trees here even, this far into the image, are still leaning but nowhere near as far. Um, and you know I could definitely keep playing with this. I'll go into the manual lens correction. I could keep playing around with it trying to remove it. But you'll see it'll just get too hard because of the distortion that's there. Um, so we'll just stick with the profile one that we had. Um, It'd just be too hard, but uh, yeah, there you go. I mean, really good shot. I mean, you can see these lights are still blown out. There's nothing you're going to do about that. You're taking a long exposure wide open at night with lights. You're going to end up getting blown highlights, um, but good shot. Now, for um, noise reduction, if we jump into detail on Lightroom, you'll see there is a noise reduction. And you've got to be really careful with this in here. Um, I'll slide it all the way up. It, it does a decent job, but it softens everything. So what I'm a big fan of is when I uh, do noise reduction, I typically do it in Photoshop, and then I will uh, use a layer mask to bring through the areas that don't have detail. So what I would probably do with this image is I'd take it into Photoshop, I'd duplicate it, I would then work on a layer, and I would just soften it, get rid of all the noise, I wouldn't deliberately soften it, but I'd get rid of all the noise that I could. And then what I would do is I would then create a, um, I would then put it behind my original photo and I would mask through the parts of the image, i.e. the sky, uh, to remove the noise, which is exactly what I did in my um, my Aurora shot. Uh, and it works really well. Um, now the other thing, and I know I mentioned earlier, I actually really like the stars reflecting in the uh, in the water, but some of it's a bit distracting now. I look at it with this composition, so don't be afraid to just touch them up if you want to. I mean, they are the reflections of the stars, so pretty awesome uh, shot of the Milky Way, that's for sure. But yeah, you can go through doing everyone. I'd probably remove this too, this building here. It's just showing everybody that. Um, Something's not right. You know, anything like that, just get rid of. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, even this one here. See how blown out this here is? Just get rid of it if you can. Just try and find something that works. You know, something like that. There we go. That looks good. And most people won't know, you know, even this one here. You know, this one here is pretty blown out. So do the same thing. Just get rid of it if you want to. I mean, the other thing is I've shown you before how to go about... Um, Oh, that didn't work. Buffed. You've got to, if you're going to do a spot removal like that on a reflection, you've got to do it on both sides at the same time. Now my my computer's lagging. Here we go. All right. So at the same time, what you want to do is you want to do it on both because you don't want your reflection to look different to what you're fixing. So I'll just go here somewhere. Like let's go to the dark patch here. Try and find something that's going to work. Mm. There we go, that sort of works there. Perfect, that'll do me. And you'll see, I mean, straight away, it's brighter. So now what I'll do is just grab a radial filter, drag a radial filter over it. This is the other thing you can do. Uh, it's just, you know... Reduce the exposure, get rid of the highlights on that spot. There we go, with a radio filter. And uh, that looks a bit better. Um, it's a bit sharp, so it probably needs a bit of a blur as well in there. But that's okay. That'll do. It gives you an idea of how you can go through and uh, and sort these things. So I can see Daniel's in the uh, chat box giving a little bit of information about the shot. He says it's right across the road from the family cabin in Tuttle, Norway. Yeah. Beautiful. Looking tasty now. White right, balance made a big difference here. I think so. John did some with the Fuji XF 16mm at one point, but the chromatic aberrations and smearing of the stars kind of spoiled it. Okay, yeah. Look, the other thing is, you know, as a photographer, you're looking at your images really uh, close up. 
Um, most people aren't. Most people are getting a shot on social media. And so, you know, you get really hung up about the detail, the noise, the pixels of this. And yeah, it does make a difference if you take a little bit of care and you work on your image. There's no doubt about it. But um, sometimes we can get a little too anal. I know I can. Because the reality is I've seen people take photos on iPhones that are absolutely amazing. Um, Because it's not all about the quality of every pixel. It's about the shot itself. What are you capturing and, you know, what's it about? What does it mean to you? But lots of uh, good shot though, Daniel. Thanks for sending that in, mate. And hopefully you like the uh, the before and the after. I'll just shoot back to that quickly so people can see that. Let's do that again. Just do the final before and after for this shot. We'll go to just hit the L button twice. That gives me that. And then I can use my backslash. Oh, I've got too many selected. Hang on. There we go. No, it's not liking that at all. Let me get back out of this. What is going on here? Okay, let's try that again. Here we go. No, what's going on? I'm using the wrong... What's... No, something weird going on here. My Lightroom is playing up. Why is it playing up? Maybe my Lightroom's corrupted. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Looks like I need to spend a bit of time working this technology out. That's for sure, isn't it? All right. Anyway, it appears I can't show you the before and the after. Let's just jump into the next shot then. All right. Oh, I know why. Because I was in the library. What a bullfed. All right. I'll get back into the develop module. Here we go. This should definitely work this time. I was in the library, and of course, in the library, you can't do before and after. You can only do that in this develop module. So there you go. So that was before. So you can see, quite overexposed. Doesn't look like nighttime. Fair bit of distortion. This is afterwards. Um, you know, a bit darker, really makes the Milky Way stand out. Different crop, less distortion. Bit of work there. All right. So now I'll jump back into the library. I did that prim I did that before, and then uh, <laughs> let's go to the next image. All right. So this one's by Stephen Cast, and uh, he sent me an email. I said, finally, I found a pier. Now, he's calling it a pier, I guess, because it is. Um, but I'm going to call it a jetty because I love jetties. Now let's look at the technical uh, details and then we'll go through and have a look at the composition and what could be done better. So here we've got a, uh, a shot taken at, oh, where's the time? 5.15 a.m. So a sunrise shot. You can see the sun sort of about to peer up over the, uh, the horizon there. He's used his Canon EOS 80D with a 24 to 105 millimeter lens. Shot at 24 mil, so he's gone as wide as he can at ISO 100, which I'd say is his lowest ISO. And he's ended up with 1.3 seconds at f8, um, which you know has worked pretty well, I think, for him. Um, and we'll just we'll jump in and have a look at some of the other details. So technically, there's probably you know you've done everything that you possibly could. Um, the only thing I would suggest that you could have done is maybe increase your aperture a little bit. The challenge with that, of course, is that you're going to increase your shutter speed. I can see this guy here. Um, was standing very still watching his uh, his rods. So, um, you know, for that particular shutter speed, it worked well. Whether you get away with a lesser one or not, I don't know. The only difference it would have made, would it would have made all of this nice and sharp. Okay, so it's a little bit out of focus. Um, but, yeah, that's high as aperture will just give you that better depth of fill, that's all. So... Um, where do we start? Let's jump into the develop module and we'll start having a look at what we could do to improve this photo. Pretty good photo, all up. A um, few things. Straight away, I can see the lights are overexposed. As normal, and I always say this, there's not a lot you can actually do about that when you're shooting at this time of the day. The lights are always going to be a bit brighter than everything else. Um, I can see, same here in this reflection, a little bit of blown highlights not many um, but pretty good 
pretty good from that perspective. So the exposure is pretty good. I wouldn't change it too much. I'd probably just drop it just a tad because, um, and this is something that typically um, I think a lot of people struggle with because they don't calibrate their monitor. Uh, and I've spoken about this before. My monitor is fully calibrated and it monitors the ambient light in this room all the time. And uh, quite often what it leads to is people having oversaturated photos or photos that the exposure is just set slightly incorrect or the white balance. So by calibrating your monitor, those three key things, um, you'll get more accurately each time. Now, the challenge is most people are seeing your images on an uncalibrated monitor if you're just sharing them online. Uh, but if you want to print them, you're going to, you're going to soon notice that things are a bit out. There's no doubt about that. All right. Now, from a composition point of view, really like it. I probably would have moved um, a little bit to the left if I could have and, incre and increased the amount of foreground a little bit because um, I'm a big fan of foreground. And that way you would have had the jetties a bit more of a leading line out. Um, these mountains out here, I don't know how well you can see these. Uh, let me zoom in. These mountains are beautifully layered. And, you know, it wouldn't matter where you... Um, point of the camera you're going to get these beautiful layers it looks like there's a bit of mist or something in the valleys as well so what i would have been tempted to do was come over here somewhere okay to the left of the shot and um, stood here somewhere and tried to get a bit more of a leading line out with the jetty and a bit more foreground but uh, that's what i would have done um the uh so from a composition point of view that's about all i would have changed the other thing that would have done that would have been great we're just giving you a little bit more separation between the the water line on the top of the jetty. And you can see how they're meeting. And these are the sort of things that you can't fix post-production. You can only fix when you're there. So, you know, you've got to keep an eye on these things when you're at these locations and, uh, you know, just go, oh, maybe I could I could just get a little bit higher. And what that'll do is just separate the jetty from that line um, because it sort of just starts to become two-dimensional uh, when, you, when you're not keeping an eye on that. Uh, but besides that, pretty good. I did notice uh, a little bit of chromatic aberration, which you've got to be careful. Uh, some lenses are worse than others. Now, if you're wondering what that is, what I'm talking about, see this fringing? So this guy here, this guy here, this post here, every single post, you'll see a magenta line. Okay, that magenta is called chromatic aberration. Now, depending on your lens, um, some lenses are really prone to it. Some lenses are less prone to it. Uh, but it's an easy thing to fix. There's a few ways that you can do it. Um, one of the ways is, and let me let's use um, let's use Lightroom to do this to start with. So if you go into uh, lens correction and you tick remove chromatic aberration, it will remove it a little bit. So you can see as soon as I've ticked, I don't know how well you can see that. I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit more to this guy here. No, that's about it. So if I click the remove chromatic aberration, it's doing a pretty good job. I can't see the fringing on the back of the posts. Um, I can only see a little bit on this guy now, uh, but I can still see something. I'll just untick it. You'll also see that on the front of him, he's got green chromatic aberrations. So they can come in different colors. But always, always, even if you can't see it, just tick that box. Okay, remove chromatic aberration. It's not going to um, hurt anything uh, by doing that. Now, the other way you can do this is... If you go into color, and it depends on your uh, image as to whether or not you'll get away with this, but if you go here in, into color here, you can actually select the magenta color and you can desaturate all the magentas in your image. Now, of course, if you are taking a picture of a rose garden full of magenta roses, probably not going to work. Um, then you can grab purple, do the same thing, desaturate it, but you can see that's going to affect other things. So you've just got to be careful. Um, but it is a way to remove chromatic aberration. Now, I, I, I'll go back to the magenta. I totally desaturated the magenta. If I show you, I'm going to get a plus 100 with the saturation. It's made no difference, right? So the only magenta in this shot is chromatic aberration. So just get rid of it. Don't be afraid to desaturate your magentas. The other thing you can do is then play with things like reds and greens. Like even the reds, if I desaturate the reds, you can see it's making no difference. Um, and the way to check and see what is red in your image is hit red and make it all the way, but it's making a difference. So just desaturate them. Okay, now by desaturating those couple of colours, we really have eliminated that 
uh, magenta hue. It's gone. Okay, completely gone. So, um, you know, from a technical image, don't be afraid to do that. Now, he's still got a little bit of green chromatic aberration on the front, but um, greens are made up of a lot of the colors that are in this shot. So if I was to grab a green or an aqua, uh, let's do green, for example, and desaturate the green, I'm going to lose the saturation in some of the other areas of my shot. So um, I've got to be careful that I don't go doing too much with those color sliders uh, because I may lose some saturation. Now, the other thing that you can do is just select an area. Um, and this is my, my, my final tip on doing this. Let's say, let me go in and we'll zoom back in on this guy. Now, he's a pretty um, small part of the image. So what I can do is I can grab a radial filter. I can put it across the top of him like this, all right? Uh, and then what I can do, I'm just going to get rid of that clarity that's on that. Uh, that's why my other one was like it was. There we go. Um, and what I can do is I can actually just desaturate him. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Now, because he's not a vital part of my image, by reducing the desaturation on him, I've got rid of that fringing. Um, so there's several ways you can do it because not every way is going to work on every image. Um, but it's important that you have a look at it. And you'll probably see this image now will have very little chromatic aberration. It's got a little bit of weird stuff going on. Um, that is just light refraction that you can't help. Some things you're not going to be able to help. But the purple fringing has definitely gone. The green fringing has gone. We're in a much better position now. It's looking much better. Okay. Um, so that gives you an idea um, of what you can do. And I can see other people in there have got other options as well. Um, so Yoris has said... Drag a graduated filter below the image so it covers the whole image and then drag defringe to 100. Yeah, you could do that. Um, and John says, but changing red like that, will it, yeah, it will affect a lot of other stuff. But in this image, it didn't. And the way to do that, I mean, like I said, if you go into the colors, as I showed you before, just go into this one here, HSL color B and white. It's on color at the moment. Because, of course, you can change it between different settings. Okay, so I'm just on color. And then you just select the color. Um, if I completely saturate the red, it does nothing. Okay, so what that is telling me that there's no reds in this image. Um, and in fact, uh, yeah, it's, it's not it's not really doing anything. So you know, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you're not seeing a difference to your naked eye when you're doing it, um, then it's pretty simple, isn't it? So there you go. That gives you the sort of an in, a few easy ways to do it. And of course, there's much more complicated ways to do it. If you're using Photoshop, you can select the fringed area and just desaturate that fringe. Um, that's that. Now, from a composition point of view, I already talked about the fact that I would like to move to a bit to the left. I'm, I'm going to... Um, oh, I didn't mean to change the angle. I'm just going to crop it up a little bit um, because I find there, some of this stuff here is a bit distracting. So I'm just going to crop it up just a tad... I'm going to also just remove these few bits of stuff, oh, which is going to be harder than we think. Um, there we go, that's good. Just go through and remove this stuff that's just in the way. I'm doing it rough, but you get the idea. Um, let me get rid of that feathering. There we go. Just clean it up so you're just getting rid of anything that's sort of distracting. Um, and if we have a look at the before and after, let me just go to this. So that was before and that's after. So I really haven't changed much. Um, you can see I've just uh, I've changed the overall exposure. Um, I'll actually I'm going to just reduce those highlights just a tad, just to bring the color out in the sky. So you can see what happens to the sky when I do that. Because let's face it, it is sunrise, right? So I'm going to do that. I'm going to adjust the whites and the blacks a bit just for the contrast. Bring the contrast up a little bit, and now it's going to reduce the vibrance a little bit, just just a tad. Um, all right, let's have another look at that. So to me, so this is before and this is after. So just gives it that depth, that clarity, just makes it look a little bit more, gives it a bit more pizzazz. Uh, the color comes out whenever you reduce the uh, the exposure or the highlights. You're going to get that um, a little bit more um, in your uh, in your colors now the other final thing on this is a bit of noise reduction could have been done um, which once again I said I don't typically use 
this uh, noise reduction, but you can. And if we zoom right in, let's zoom right in, you'll see what it does. Um, it really softens things. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but it really softens things to the point where it's doing weird stuff to the edges because this is a smaller file. And so you can just sort of play with stuff and just see, you know, sometimes it's just about mucking around with the settings to get what you want, but it's just made it like a, a pastel painting now, so it's horrible. So for me, I don't use... Uh, global noise reduction. I always do it in uh, in Photoshop if I've got to reduce noise because it just works so much better. Alrighty, so that one was from uh, Stephen Cast. Thanks for sending that in, Stephen. Uh, aka, aka Stephen. I think you've got another username, do you? I'm not sure. I lose track of who calls themselves what in the chat box. And. Finally, we're going to have a look at John, uh, Rob Roy's image. Um, and Rob's, is a, it's a good image. Great exposure, good clarity. Everything's looking good there. Um, uh, for me, um, only a couple of small changes. I probably would have tried to shoot a bit to the right, but it's hard. There's all this beautiful mossy stuff hanging down. I don't know what I would have done um, to, to try and get around that. Um, I probably would have moved a little bit to try and change this railing to be a bit more of a leading end line, but it sort of works that way. But I just feel like it's, you know, down here is nothing. Um, and my eye wants to know what's down here. Is it a beautiful wooden bridge? What is it? I don't know. Um, technically, if we have a look, ISO 1000, 15 millimeters, F23 seconds, shot with a Nikon D500 with a, a Tokina. Uh, 11 to 16 millimeter lens. Now I don't know why you shot at a thousand ISO. Uh, maybe you wanted to get that quicker shutter speed, um, but you were at f20. You probably could have been at f16 or something like that, um, and reduce this a little bit. Uh, but it's not going to make a huge difference in this image if your ISO is too high because the noise is not going to be very apparent. You can look all through this image and finding noise is going to be hard because of the texture of all the things in this image. The focus is spot on. Um, I think the shutter speed is perfect for the water, um, which is cool. Really well done there, Rob. Uh, from a composition point of view, let's just jump into the develop module. From a composition point of view, I think, like I said, it could have been changed slightly. I probably would be more inclined to do something like this um, because all this bush on the right, whilst it's beautiful, is not... Uh, giving me anything it's not adding a lot to the image and i'll just undo that so you can see the difference um of what i did all i did if you can if i go back out here you see that's that's where we were all i did was just bring it in now you could have done that with your lens so when you're on the location just zoom in a bit and what i'm doing is i'm putting this crosshair of the rule of thirds on that white rapids there um now this waterfall is on this line here and this structure now is on this these intersections here so it just makes it a little bit more um, appealing now somebody's saying i'm wondering if it's handheld i doubt it it's three seconds so it would definitely be on a tripod um would never be this sharp i mean i can read what it says here i mean have a look at this he's got he's, he's nailed the focus i mean we can read what it says there let me try not to zoom in too much crikey lightroom my tablet's doing weird things but you can see that it's, uh, you know, you can read that it says something about a mill. Uh, Cedar Creek, something mill. Um, you know, I can see the definition of the windows. Beautiful shot, a really good shot. Um, but that's probably all I would have changed is maybe just a bit of a, uh, uh, like I said, a nice crop like that, just to bring that in a bit. Um, there's not a lot I could do. I could probably reduce the highlights a little bit on this top corner. I don't know if you can see up here. Um, and I would just... I would be tempted to do my normal trick, which is a grade up the top, reduce the exposure up the top because it's quite bright up there. Um, so just, you know, just put a grade up there and reduce the exposure. Just something like that. Um, the overall exposure of the image is pretty good. The contrast is good. There's not a lot I would change, to be honest with you. I really like it. I think he's got the white balance pretty close. Maybe just drop it a tad. Let's see. Somewhere about, the, somewhere about there, maybe. 
Where are we going to go? Got to get the tent right on the water. The water is your, is your friend when you're doing white balance on uh, this type of scene. And then just change the tint slightly. Um, yeah. Looks really nice. Nice image. Um, let me just bring the whites up a bit. Here we go. So now I'll show you my before and after. And so all I've done is a little bit of tweaking, but mainly it was a crop. Um, and the reason I cropped it was for two reasons. Down here, um, that was really teasing me because it was showing me too much of this fence line. I was wondering what was down here. And on the right, there was just too much uh, busyness in the trees. It was, uh, you know, it was stopping me from really seeing um, what I really wanted to see, you know, from a from a from an imagery point of view. Um, I could probably, like I said, I would like to have seen it shot a little bit more to the left, but... You know, it's a great shot. It looks really good. But okay, let's have a look. Here's the before and here's the after. So all I did was I, I put that grad across the top. Can you see the difference that makes putting the grad over the top? So it's quite bright up there. And now we've just brought that down. And then I've just, what I did was I dropped the blacks and I increased the contrast slot. And I actually reduced the vibrance slot. I thought it was just a bit overdone. Um, and you can see the detail really popping in that uh, in that building. And... Um, for me, that's just a really nice image. The only other thing I probably would do, um, and I don't know, I'm going to try it, is I'll get my brush and I'll just probably hit this building with a bit more of a clarity just to really make it stand out. But it's already looking good. And same with the, with the water down here. Just hit it with the clarity brush a little bit and make it really pop. Something like that. Okay, let's have another look. And I don't even know if you can see that difference on YouTube. Yeah, it does. It makes a difference. And someone did, um, it's funny, you know, somebody asked me on um, my YouTube channel the other day, how do I go about making, getting the clarity? Um, well, it is just by doing that. You want to get clarity in something, grab your clarity brush and just brush over what it is you want really to pop out. Um, and you can see all I've done is I've just increased the depth of this image. A bit flat there, a bit more depth, fix the white balance, fix the contrast. Uh, and the composition slightly by cropping but top image mate top image well done well done so let's say a big thank you to the three guys that sent in their photos which was let's go back to this these three here daniel causland stephen cast and rob roy and of course stephen alga who sent in his viewer kit as well big thanks to stephen for doing that we uh, appreciate you sharing your kit with us and letting us know um, what you're using to shoot landscapes with and of course i'd love to get more of those uh so i can share that with the group every every week with the live stream um, yeah but good image good image and um, hopefully you found all those tips helpful and my little adjustments uh, just you know i think what i'm seeing especially from you guys that are a lot of you are giving me images on a regular basis i'm actually seeing quite an improvement in fact rob um rob roy was who started this whole thing i don't know how long ago now um 26 episode, episodes ago because he asked me to critique an image and i can tell you that his images have gone um from strength to strength since we started especially his post-processing so getting that depth in the image so when you're looking at the photo you feel like you're there uh, and that's really what you want you know you really want to feel like you're standing there uh, and that's the essence of a good photo uh, in my opinion a good landscape photo makes the viewer feel like they're there it immerses them into the into the location uh, without them having to be there and i think that's why people buy beautiful photos and stick them on their walls at home because they want to go on a they want to go on a mini holiday uh, without the expense of the holiday they want to feel like they're you know they're viewing a beautiful scene so yeah, good job guys good photos and uh, hopefully you enjoyed the uh, the tips and the uh, the the edits that i made once again there's no right or wrong right so and i always say this that uh, i'm editing them the way that i like to edit but it's like a, a singer it's like an artist it's like a um, you know anybody who creates stuff you know you've got to you're going to create what you create i see some famous photographers and i don't like their photography at all it doesn't mean that it's not right it just means it's not my style so um, you know more than anything just take the technical parts because i think that's important for any photographer to learn that it's one thing to take a photo but then to be able to te technically get it correct um, which then ha helps you when you get to the part where you start to process uh, because you'll do things like reduce uh, the issues like distortion you'll reduce things like chromatic aberration you'll reduce things like uh, noisy uh, pixels hot pixels you know your composition you can't change in the computer you've got to do that on site so you know all of these things that you can start thinking about which is cool
All right. Um, let's check the chat box one last time, and then we'll finish up. Now, before I forget, in case any of you want to run off now, because I know we've gone slightly over time, there is no Pixel Chatter next week. I'm heading away for a week up to the uh, mid-north coast of New South Wales, and uh, I'm going to take my camera and do a few uh, vlogs, get a few new vlogs done. Uh, so that's where I am for the next week. Uh, so there won't be any pixel chatter next week, but I'll be back the week after. So make sure that if you do have an image to critique or you've got a viewer kit you want to share with us, that you send it in to Ben at on 3 legscom All right, jumping into the chat box now. Uh, yeah, great images, Rob. Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Go back in the chat. Lots of chat going on. Where is this? Love that image. Rob Roy, nice image. Yeah, it was good. Topaz Denoise for tough cases. Yeah, Topaz Denoise is a good one. All right, I think I've caught up on the chat. I wonder if it was handheld since the high side. I always said no. Very nice image, Rob. It's Grist Mill. Yep, cool. Makes flour. Awesome. Uh, great image for a jigsaw. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> great image for that. Uh Maybe he held his breath for three seconds. <laughs> Maybe he did. Maybe he's a super photographer because it's a really sharp image. So he's, he's done good. It's actually a real good lens there. That's the Tokina uh, ATX116 Pro DX 11 to 16. And he's got that on his Nikon D500. So if anybody's looking for a good wide angle lens, uh, it's a cracking lens. And of course, I don't get paid anything to say that, but uh, I get to see a lot of images. And that lens seems to produce good, crisp results all the time. Um, where are we? Nice submissions, nice edits. Thank you, John. Andrew Mar, g'day, buddy. Good to see you back. Uh, beautiful images. Everyone's saying g'day to Andrew. Yeah, Andrew's got a lovely YouTube channel as well. Go and make sure you check out Andrew's channel. Uh, have a great weekend, says Chance. You too, Chance. Have a good trip, says Sound and Image. Thank you. Thanks to all the people, yes. Let's hope that this year's Tassie does not flood like last year in May. I hope not. <laughs> but no matter what happens, we'll be taking photos. We'll be there. We'll be capturing whatever nature throws at us, uh, which is what it's all about. Another great show. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, guys. Well, I have gone 12 minutes over time. I like to try and finish at 9.30. But, of course, we had the little five-minute interlude with my <laughs> computer crashing. Uh, so we won't uh, we won't do that again. Yeah, and Sounds and Images has just put a thumbs up to Andrew Mars channel. Andrew has some great stuff on there, so go and check that out. Um, I think both of us struggle to get stuff up there every week because uh, I subscribe to his channel as well because um, we have uh, full-time gigs we have as well, which makes it a little bit difficult. But uh, we do our best to keep the content coming. And, uh, you know, sometimes that can be a little bit difficult, but hopefully you've enjoyed what we brought you in 2017. And uh, I'm going to make an effort to really pump the... the uh, the content out in 2018 because i know that you're all enjoying it i enjoy creating it so yeah cool stuff all right well have a fantastic weekend thanks for tuning into pixel chatter and until next time which is remember as i said next week there is no pixel chatter so you have to wait till the week after uh, so until next episode of pixel chatter get out there and take some photos cheerio